Okay, well, thanks for uh, getting up early. I imagine uh, 6 a.m. is earlier than you normally uh, lecture there. Yes. So uh, thanks for, for doing that for us. Um, so Alan Gunther was here over last summer, and he was last year's, or this current year's actually, uh, joint visiting fellow with the Manchester Wesley Research Center and John Ryland's research institute and he spent some time, six weeks here working on uh, 19th century Methodist hymns and how they were used uh, in missionary contexts and you'll find out more about that in uh, Alan's presentation. So he's talking to us from uh, Saskatchewan where he's uh, assistant professor of history at Briarcrest College and Seminary. Thanks, Alan. All right. Um, my interest in uh, this topic did not start with an immersion in the history of this movement in Britain. Rather, I was led from my research of Christian Muslim relations in the 19th century uh, uh, to, uh, to study the work of American Methodist Episcopal Church among Muslim communities in North India, and then to focus specifically on the hymn books published by Methodists in India that were adapted to their Muslim and Hindu context. How's the sound coming to you? A little bit variable. Okay. Try another. It'll be his microphone. Yeah. If you push that and it flashes, it's muted. Yeah. Let's uh, try a little bit more and then we'll see how it goes. Uh, from that rather narrow focus, I decided to step back and explore the broader background of Methodist hymnody, beginning with the hymn books published in Britain after the deaths of Charles and John Wesley at the end of the 18th century. How's that doing? Okay, so I'll, okay. I'll go ahead and proceed then. All right. So my interest was still uh, the history of global Christianity and thus chose to trace the development of global awareness of Methodist movements in Britain. Why would one study hymn books? Aside from the fact that uh, the John Ryan's library has an astounding collection of Methodist hymn books, I see hymnody as an expression of what local congregations find meaningful. Yes, the, the hymn, publication of hymn books is at times tightly controlled by the leader of the movement or by a committee to which authority has been delegated by the conference, and can be an expression of what the leaders consider to be important. But recent scholarship on congregational singing in global Christianity posits that Christian communities worldwide adapt, adopt, create, perform, and share congregational music, making it locally meaningful and useful in the construction of Christian beliefs, theology, practice, and identity. With that understanding, congregational singing and the collection of hymns published are a reflection of not just what the leadership of a movement decides is necessary, but of what the congregation as a whole finds to be, a meaning, mean, be meaningful expressions of its worship, testimony, and aspirations. Hymn books, and particularly alterations in success, successive editions, can be useful in tracing changes in the life of a congregation or a denomination. How the various streams of British Methodists viewed the rapidly growing missionary movement of the 19th century should then be reflected in the hymn books they published. The key theme explored in this paper then is the impact of the formation of the Wesleyan Methodist Missionary Society or WMMS and of the work of missionaries overseas on Methodist congregations in Britain as reflected in the hymn books published for their use. British Methodists had engaged in cross-cultural ministry in other parts of the world prior to the formation of the WMMS, but it was the first meeting of the District of Auxiliary in Leeds in 1813, which established a pattern for the involvement of local congregations in the global enterprise. Interested in individuals and congregations would gather to pray, to receive information, and to collect and disperse funds to support missionaries and ministries overseas. The impact of these gatherings on the hymn hymnody of the church was twofold. An increasing global awareness was reflected in the lyrics of new hymns being written, and the gatherings themselves created a demand for hymns 
that would be suitable for singing on such occasions. While the earliest of such hymns focused on the desperate plight of the heathen without the gospel and on intercession for those nations, the growth of the missionary movement also meant that hymns were eventually needed, that which would be appropriate for singing at services for sending missionaries. As the 19th century continued, entire songbooks were devoted to the topic of missions. This paper traces the initial appearance of this emphasis and its early development in the hymn books published by various branches of the Methodist movement. And I've deliberately focused on those hymn books which came after uh, John Wesley's death. Uh, he had published the, 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 the kind of the standard hymn book in 1780, but I wanted to see what was happening afterwards, and that's kind of what I've been focusing on. A related theme is a growing awareness that one of the consequences of the missionary efforts was the establishment of communities of believers in other cultures. No longer were the people overseas merely benighted heathen, Rather, they had received the same grace and were now brothers and sisters in the family of God, also singing the praise of Jesus Christ. From the start, Methodist missionaries and indigenous Christians were active in translating hymns, writing new songs, and publishing hymn books for the use of new congregations overseas. These new songs had a limited impact on the, on the hymnody of churches in Britain, and it was not until the latter half of the 20th century that Methodists made concerted efforts to create a global hymnody. Although the Methodist churches in Britain were slow to incorporate songs composed outside of Britain and other parts of Europe, early examples of such global awareness did occur and are highlighted in this paper. The first hymn book to be examined is, in fact, not a Methodist hymn book, but one prepared for interdenominational gatherings in the city of Bristol but it illustrates the key themes just outlined. The book, hymns intended for the use of United Congregations of Bristol at their monthly prayer meeting for the success of the gospel at home and abroad, was published in the final years of the 18th century. The preface indicates that churches from various denominations had to decide to gather, to gather together in a show of unity to pray for the success of evangelistic efforts in Britain and overseas. The formation of missionary societies such as the Baptist Missionary Society in 1792, the London Missionary Society by the Congregationalists in 1795, and the Church Missionary Society by the Evangelicals in the Church of England in 79, uh, 1799 were seen as the product of such prayer meetings as well as a motivation for increased prayer. While the WMMS would not be created until 15 years later, the editors made specific mention of the work of Methodists and of the Moravians in various parts of the world. The motivation for creating the hymn book was that as the Christians would gather, the song books they brought with them were diverse, making, sing, and making it difficult to sing songs together. Thus the prayer meetings for missions were the impetus for compiling a new hymn book that could enhance their praying and worshiping together. The interdenominational group of editors selected hymns from each denomination, giving priority to those within each congregation uh, with, with which each congregation was best acquainted. Aware that hymns were likely to contain doctrinal emphasis peculiar to specific domination, denominations, care was taken not to include phrases that another group might find offensive. They wrote in the preface, we hope none of our people will be offended that we have on this occasion attempted to please them all and have mutually endeavored to suppress such peculiar phrases as might hurt anyone's conscience to adopt. None of us mean to sacrifice truth to peace, but we trust we have learned to speak the truth in love. We will not willingly offend one another, nor will we be easily offended. Predictably, the largest topical section was of hymns for the general spread of the gospel with 24 hymns, a third of which were by Charles Wesley, another third or so by Isaac Watts, and the remaining hymns by other composers. While John Wesley had included a section of hymns for believers interceding for the world in his 1780, 1780 standard hymn book, a collection of hymns for the use of the people called Methodists, none of those songs was selected for the interdenominational book. Rather, five of the entries by Charles Wesley came from his hymns on select passages of the Holy Scriptures, 
published in 1762, and consisted of poetical reflections on passages from Isaiah. A co comparison of the edited versions with the original publications demonstrate that some of the deleted phrases refer to the Methodist understanding of unlimited atonement. And I've, on the sheet of hymns, I have given you uh, uh, several examples. And so the, the sheet will give you some of the examples of uh, Charles Wesley's hymns, even though I'm focusing on that which came later. So on the first page of the hymns, you will see the, uh, the song that I mentioned there, uh, Sing Ye Heavens and Earth Rejoice. Um, so in this hymn, the, the following supplication was uh, omitted. Come thou uni universal friend, human miseries to end. Jews and Turks and heathens call, all receive who diedst for all. Likewise, in Wesley's song, Father of Boundless Grace, and that's on the second page, the first four lines of the song were, uh, were omitted, removing reference to boundless grace, along with later mentions of the inclusion of people from every tongue and nation. It would appear that the editors sought to avoid offending those with a strong commitment to a more Calvinistic understanding of limited atonement. What is evident from the lyrics that were included is a shared expectation of Jesus Christ fulfilling prophecies regarding the establishment of his millennial kingdom, which would be global in its extent. While its efforts to encourage ecumenical singing and intercession on behalf of global missions is important, this hymn book holds another distinction, that of being possibly the first British hymn book to include a song written by a convert from Hinduism. The final hymn in the book, Who Beside Can Man Recover, under the heading, a hymn composed in the year 1788 by a, an Hindu, translated by Mr. Thomas, imitated in verse for the use of English Christians, um, is um, is the, uh, the composer of this hymn was Ram Ram Basu, a writer who had served as the language teacher for John Thomas, an independent missionary who began his ministry in Bengal in 1786, 1787, six years before the arrival of William Carey. When Carey arrived, he too employed Ram Basu as his teacher. As more missionaries arrived in Bengal, they would gather on Sunday mornings and sing this hymn, as well as others, uh, other translated hymns in the Bengali language. Thomas sent a translation of the hymn to Britain where it was published, along with a version more adapted to English congregational singing. This, it was this adapted version that was included in the hymn book. Its inclusion demonstrates not only an increasing global awareness, but an acknowledgement that Christians from another culture, from another part of the world, could make a valid contribution to British worship as equal members of the family of God. In spite of this early example, however, British Methodist hymn books were much slower in incorporating hymns composed by contemporary believers outside of Britain. The Methodist leader who was the chief promoter of overseas missions in the last quarter of the 18th century was Thomas Cope. As early as 1784, he had published a plan of the Society for the Establishment of Missions Among the Heathen, but it was not implemented at that time. And some have speculated that perhaps even these other missionary societies, which I've mentioned, the London Missionary Society, perhaps even the Baptist Missionary Society, might have been uh, somewhat uh, based on, on this initial plan, which seems to have been interdenominational from the start. Cook himself was soon busy with his duties as the newly ordained superintendent and later bishop of the Methodist work in the United States of America. His passion for global missions continued, however, and he advocated strongly for outreach to the West Indies, as well as regions in Africa and Asia, and ministers responded to his call, becoming missionaries, without the backing of an official missionary society, and we'll look at one a little bit later. As the English conference made plans to send their first missionaries to Ceylon in uh, 1813, he pleaded with them for the opportunity to participate in the expedition and departed at the end of that year. He never arrived because, because it was on that voyage he died. His example of sacrifice in the cause of global missions became the impetus behind, behind the organization and expansion of the Wesleyan missionary movement. While his work in America and in the cause of missions globally is well known, 
Cook's contribution to Methodist hymnody is not. He was the first to publish a revised edition of the standard hymn book published by John Wesley in 1780, a collection of hymns for the use of the people called Methodists. His, standard, uh, his revision in 1804, though, uh, subtitled A New Edition, much improved and enlarged, retained most of the hymns in the original and much of Wesley's organization. With regard to hymns on the theme of global missions, Coke made only a few changes, incorporating an additional hymn by Charles Wesley in the section for believers' intercession, and another also by Wesley in, in a section of additional hymns at the end of the book. The latter was one entitled, Come Thou Conqueror of the Nation, that Wesley's had first published in a book, Hymns on the Expected Nation, at a time when England placed itself in the nation and troops during the Seven Years' War. After his death, Coke's, Coke's hymn book was republished in 1819 and again in 1823 with minor additions, but one of the songs added to the additional hymns was Hark the War Has Stilled Its Clangor, uh, written after the initial victory over Napoleon and his exile to the island of Elba. The hymn first appeared as a poem published in the Wesleyan Methodist Magazine of 1815, where it was attributed to J. Redfern Hanley, January 6, 1815. Nothing more is known about the author, but because it immediately follows an elegy to Dr. Koch, it may have been composed in Koch's honor. And again, the, the, uh, this hymn I have uh, reprinted in, uh, on the third page of the hymns. The hymn itself differs from the intercession hymns by Charles Wesley in a couple of significant ways. It still rejoices in the hope of Christ's millennial reign on earth, but rather than focusing on intercession, it focuses on action. Rise, ye heralds of salvation, blow the gospel trumpet, blow, go to every tribe and nation, hear, your master bids you go. The use of means in establishing Christ's kingdom is now strongly advocated, and believers are challenged to go. And this is a theme, of course, that, that uh, William Carey uh, developed in his uh, early book as well, arguing for the establishment of the Baptist Missionary Society, the use of means to spread the gospel. Also, British imperialism, particularly its naval dominance, is, uh, is seen as um, a gift of divine providence for the purpose of spreading the gospel. By a heavenly arm protected, see her head with glory crowned, for a noble cause elected, gospel truth to spread around. And the references to the Navy continue in that, uh, in that verse, in that stanza. The hymn did not become widely popular, but one of the offshoots of the primitive Methodists, that of the female revivalists, included it, included it in both editions of its hymn book, omitting the first more to triumphalist verses, however. One of the missionaries encouraged by Thomas Cook to engage in overseas missions was Joshua Marsden. He initially volunteered to serve in the British colonies of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, arriving in 1800. Eight years later, Cook encouraged Marsden to relocate to Bermuda, or the Summers Islands, as he calls them, to work among the African slaves. In 1814, he returned with his family to Britain, um, and that was after a short stay in the United States because of the uh, 1812 war that was happening at that time. In addition to being, being one of the earliest missionaries sent by the Wesleyan Church, Marsden published a number of works of poetry, as well as prose, in which he reflected on his missionary experience. One of his poems, Go Ye Messengers of God, from which I've taken the title of uh, this, this talk, became, popular, uh, became a popular missionary hymn in America, and was included in hymn books from a range of denominations. It was published as a poem of 11 verses in the first volume of the Evangelical Magazine and Missionary Chronicle. The following year, a Congregationalist a preacher of New England, As Asahel Nettleton, included selected verses in his hymn book, Village Hymns for Social Worship. Even though Marsden was part of the British Wesleyans, his hymn would not appear in any of the hymn books published by Methodists in Britain, until John Flesher published a version of his hymn for the Primitive Methodists in 1869. 
Interestingly, Flesher followed the selection and arrangement of verses chosen by the Methodist Episcopal Church for their 1849 hymn book, in which references to the blacks and the Negro were replaced with the more generic terms of the oppressed and pagan, perhaps yielding to the racial sensitivities of those church members who were not ready to accept African-American believers as their equal brothers and sisters. As a missionary working among Africans of Bermuda, Marsden had encountered such racial prejudice when a woman objected to his baptizing the child of one of her slaves on the basis that slaves had no souls. Marsden would not have approved the changing of the words to his poem. Aside from his advocacy of the plight of slaves in the West Indies, Marsden's hymn, hymns also, Marsden's hymn also departs from the pattern established by Charles Wesley's hymns of intercession. Not content to simply pray that God's kingdom would be established and that Christ would take up his inheritance, Marsden also repeatedly exhorts his readers to go around the world with the message of the cross of Christ. He calls them to go to Muslims and Hindus, to African slaves and the native peoples of America, to Arabia, Central Asia, Greenland, and Africa, demonstrating a remarkable knowledge of global missionary efforts in the early 18th century. His own involvement in missionary efforts in British North America, as well as in the West Indies, led him to advocate the use of means in the spreading of the gospel. Echoing Wesley's emphasis on the universal appeal of the gospel, Marsden exhorts, preach the cross of Christ to all, Jesus' love is full and free. However, perhaps as a warning against the use of imperialistic forces, he insists, conquer by the cross alone. Another area in which Marsden represents a globalization of the Methodist hymn book is the production of hymns for congregations in missionary lands. His writings give perhaps the earliest account of a Methodist missionary composing songs for non-Western believers. In his collection of poetry, Amusements of a Mission, Marsden includes eight hymns which he had composed for the people of color in the Summers Islands, who were not slaves and thus better informed in his words than mere plantation Negroes. He noted that it was because he had no hymn books at that time that he had written these eight, as well as a few others, for their use. A dominant theme of most of the hymns is that Christ died for all for the African as well as for the European, and that all are included in the invitation to receive his grace and become a child of God, echoing the universal call earlier noted in the hymns of Charles Wesley. There's mercy for all, Redeemer in thee, who come at thy call, the captive or free. God spreads a table and all may partake, the white man or sable for Jesus' sake. Ye black men, draw near from African lands. He'll banish your fear and sweeten your bands. Though deeply oppressed with slavery's chain, our Jesus the blessed with smiles will, will sustain. While he promises spiritual redemption and freedom from fear for those who are enslaved, he does not address emancipation, but only suggests that Christ will sustain them in their bondage. In two of the hymns, he declares that their capture, enslavement, and transportation across the Atlantic was the means God used to bring them within the hearing of the gospel. But providence led our steps to these isles where coarse is our bread and slavish our toils. Yet mercy has given a rose with our rod and bondage has driven the Negro to God. Nevertheless, Marsden promotes their equality before God and exhorts that efforts be made to communicate the gospel to them so that they might be redeemed by the blood of Christ and become children of God. Unfortunately, the hymns that he wrote for congregations in Bermuda were not adopted by any of the congregations in Britain or America and were not republished in any hymn books, it would appear. And I'd be happy to be proven wrong if someone can locate some of those hymns in modern hymn books. Looking then at the, the Methodist movements in the early 18th century, we'll start with them, the Wesleyan Methodists and Richard Watson. While the Wesleyan Methodists tended to adhere to the canon of hymnody established by the Wesleys, the newer Methodist movements readily experimented with newer compositions, including music from overseas, uh, namely America. Within the Wesleyan Methodists, 
The next, next significant revision of the hymn book was done in 1831 at the instruction of the conference. The editor who took on most of the responsibility for the changes was Richard Watson, better known for his contributions in theology. After the death of Coke, Watson also played a major part, a major role in the organization of the WMMS in 1813 and served as the secretary of the society during its most formative years from 1816 to 1826. Unlike Koch, however, in his supplement to the 1780 hymn book, Watson did incorporate 19 new hymns in a new section entitled On the Establishment and Extension of the Kingdom of Christ. However, he was conservative in his selection, the major majority of which uh, had been written by Charles Wesley, but had not been included in the 1780 hymn book, such as the one examined earlier, Father of Boundless Grace. The six exceptions inc included in this section, this section by Watson were all written by Isaac Watts, the uh, Congregationalist hymn writer from the generation that preceded the Wesleys, uh, and the songs include one that had become a standard missionary hymn in other British denominations, Jesus Shall Reign Where'er the Sun. Watson was not the first British Methodist to recognize its value in expressing the aspiration of global missions. Hugh Bourne, of the Primitive Methodists had added it to his hymn book seven years earlier in 1834. No doubt aided by interdenominational gatherings such as the one, ones in Bristol discussed earlier, a genre of missionary hymns that was common across denominational lines was beginning to take shape and having an impact on a new generation of hymn books. The Methodist New Connection parted ways with uh, the Wesleyan Methodists in 1797 and published their first hymn book three years later. In a selection of miscellaneous hymns, all but three were once again composed by Charles Wesley. In addition to another hymn by Isaac Watts, the editors had inserted one by William Williams of Paterson, the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist preacher and hymn writer, and one by William Shrubso, a Congregationist, both of whom were contemporaries of Charles and John Wesley. Like Watts hymn, hymn uh, William's composition, or the gloomy hills of darkness, and the one by Shrubso, bright as the sun's meridian blaze, soon became standard missionary songs published repeatedly in hymn books by many different denominations. In addition to writing hymns, William Shrubso fits the pattern of Coke and, and Watson in that he too was actively promoting a missionary society, the London Missionary Society in his case. It was, however, the primitive Methodists who are remarkable for their willingness to depart from the Wesleyan canon and adopt new songs from across the Atlantic or compose brand new hymns to express their missionary passion. When Hugh Bourne was expelled from the Wesleyan Connection because of his support for and participation in camp meetings in 1808, he began to organize the Primitive Methodists. The following year, he published his first songbook, a general collection of hymns and spiritual songs for camp meetings, revivals, etc. Uh, but he would publish several more during his ministry. That Bourne would include foreign content, content uh, is to be expected because he was advocating the use of camp meeting evangelism patterned after the American practices. Since singing spiritual songs were an integral part of the camp meeting experience, the introduction of these songs into his publications was a natural development. He had been heavily influenced by the American evangelist Lorenzo Dow and used Dow's hymn book in, in his meetings. In one sense, this hymn book demonstrates a global awareness that is distinct from the expressly missionary hymns we have studied. Bourne rather incorporates a new hymnody, one that was indigenous to America, in his hymn books. When the main body of Wesleyans condemned these forms of worship and evangelism, he chose to chart a new path. Bourne appears to have been the first to publish a, a version of an African-American spiritual in a British hymn book. One of the songs in his 1818 edition of a general collection of hymns and spiritual songs has the intriguing title, subtitle, A New African Hymn, and I've included that also in the selections of hymns that I printed. That would be on the last page. And can be traced to books published in 1801 by Richard Allen, 
the founder of the uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. And then I find this intriguing. Uh, subsequently, another primitive Methodist, uh, John Stamp, would have published some others that, that, that he would connect with the African American, especially the slavery experience. And, and I find that's been uh, uh, very, very little has been studied with regard to them. With the consolidation of his movement, Born issued a large hymn book for the use of the primitive Methodists in 1824, patterning himself after John Wesley's 1780 publication for his movement. In this, Born included a section explicitly on the spread of the gospel, many of which were written by him and a fellow composer, William Sanders. And I've again included a couple of uh, examples. However, Warren's conception of spreading the gospel has less of a global element and does not distinguish between evangelistic efforts in Britain and those overseas. In this, he more nearly reflects John Wesley's own perception of the task of mission as expressed in his statement um, or declaration, I look upon all the world as my parish. As jo Andrew Wald states, the argument and the context make it plain that however ready John Wesley may have been in principle to go to Abyssinia or to China, he did not expect to go to either. He expected to preach the glad tidings of salvation in English parishes to baptize people in a society that claimed to be Christian. Although Bourne demonstrates a global awareness in one form by including spiritual songs from American camp meetings, his conception of global missions does not appear to have been greatly influenced by the introduction of missionary societies. Those songs of his which do have a global content, such as the two included in the hymn sheet, parallel the intercession songs of Charles Wesley expressing hope in the coming millennial kingdom of Christ. Other groups, such as, such as the Armenian Bible Christians and the Wesleyan Association, also published hymn books with significant sections on missions, which I plan to study, uh, plan to include in my study. Subsequent generations of these groups generated even more publications and demonstrate an ongoing growth of global awareness and participation in global missions. But these early years indicate that although early leaders of the Wesleyan Methodists were committed to sustaining the legacy of hymnody bequeathed by John and Charles Wesley, the birth and growth of the WMMS and other missionary societies, as well as reports from missionaries overseas, was having an impact on congregations in Britain and on the songs they were singing. This impact can be traced in the successive hymn books published by the various strands of the Methodist movement. New Methodist movements were more open to experimentation and more readily incorporated hymns from outside the uh, British Methodist tradition in their songbooks. While the global awareness would continue to grow steadily throughout the 19th century and then more rapidly in the 20th century, the seeds of this form, uh, a form of globalization is evident even in the earliest Methodist hymn books. Thanks very much, Alan. It's good to see some of the fruits of your research while you were here in this paper. So we've got some time for questions and discussion now. Julie. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting paper. Um, I was interested in what you said about how um, Charles Wesley's um, hymns had words taken out of them. Um, were those words we be written, or were they just deleted and the sort of verses squashed together in some way? They were simply they deleted. Were simply deleted. Uh, uh, perhaps also the editors just needed to shorten some of the hymns. Charles Wesley sometimes could go on at length in his hymns. Uh, so yes, the words were just deleted. Uh, I haven't studied the reverse. What about uh, Isaac Watts hymns? Were some words deleted to please the Methodists? Uh, I haven't looked at that, but I did find it intriguing to see the, uh, 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 this limited atonement theme um, being emphasized. I, I thought that was interesting. Charles Wesley would have been horrified by, I'm sure. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> as well as the, the way that the structure of the hymns is completely destroyed when people do that. But, you know, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. It also just, it also just 
Oh, uh, uh, I, I'm going to feed back. That, 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 that confuses me. Um, it's also uh, just an interesting parallel for today that um, some people complain that hymns have verses removed and new courses added. Well, that's been happening for 200 years. <laughs> it's nothing new. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I wonder, how are you measuring the popularity of the hymns? So is it just the appearance of them in multiple publications or are there other indicators that give you insight into their popularity? That's an excellent question. I've wondered that myself, if there's a way to gauge that. You do come across mentions in various uh, journals, Methodist journals and others, where uh, uh, an account of a meeting is given and it indicates which hymn was sung. Uh, I haven't gone through that systematically to see which are used, and so I have relied on the hymn books themselves. Um, my experience is more in, in uh, looking at Indian hymn books and, and there the connection between the congregation and the hymn books, uh, the, the hymns included in the hymn book seems much, much more immediate. And so you'll have several hymn books published in a matter of 25 years, each changing significantly. I don't see that as much in Britain. It, se it, it seems to take a committee appointed by the conference before a new hymn book can be published. But um, uh, there, uh, separate hymn books are published, uh, and, and I've looked at some of those that, that aren't official hymn books, and they would include other uh, songs as well. And so, yes, it's been primary to see how often these hymns are seen in hymn books that are published. Someone, that, is it Stephen Marini, something like that, who's done that for the American hymn books in kind of late 18th, early 19th century, looked at a lot of the hymn books and which ones were used most widely and popularly. So that right. might give you some indication, though it's just the American context I think he looks at in, in his study. But he looks at a number of different so that's, that's helpful. That's, that's helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, are the authors of these hymns uh, attributed in all of these hymn books? Are there any books that, that don't list the author, it just has the hymn, so the editor made the choices, but there's no indication of who actually wrote it? Uh, for the most part, uh, in the early, 18th, uh, early 19th century, the, the authors are not listed. And I've relied heavily on the website hymnary.org, uh, which helps to trace the authors of a lot of these hymns. And, and this website relies on later publications where efforts have been made to trace the writers. Uh, there, there are also a number of books written at the end of the 19th century telling the stories of hymns, and so those have also been helpful. And, uh, and then later hymn, hymn books, yes, they, they do have the authors, and so you have to kind of trace back to find the authors. That's why there are still some gaps, uh, like the, uh, the one, this, this new African hymn. I've not been able to find uh, any writer um, the earliest appearance does seem to be in the late 1700s, uh, but Richard Allen, certainly this, this uh, strong African-American Methodist leader, uh, see, uh, has published it in his, his books. So, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's some, sometimes by association, uh, and, and takes a little bit of digging, um, but that's, that's fun <laughs> to try to find the authors. Thank you. Uh, David. Oh. I'm uh, intrigued by the, and not surprised, by the Richard Allen piece showing up in Bourne's collection because right. of uh, right. Allen's closeness with Dow. So my question would be, uh, did, you, did you notice or have you had time to look, which is a lot of reasons why this is a big task, uh, to look to see if there are more connections between Allen's songbook, Dow's songbooks, and uh, Hugh Bourne's uh, collections. I think that would be an excellent uh, project to pursue. I haven't done that yet. I've, I've just begun to look at Richard Allen's work, and I, I haven't even looked at uh, Dow's hymn book, which uh, I, did, I did see mentioned that he, uh, that uh, Bourne had distributed it quite widely, uh, but that would be an excellent, uh, uh, excellent uh, thing to pursue. So recommend it to some of the students. Okay. Thank you very much for the paper.
uh, speaking out of complete ignorance about most of this stuff because this is not my area, but I'm really fascinated by the shortened version was included in a selection of hymns for the use of female revivalists. In your investigation, what were the criteria that were uh, used to determine what hymns would be included in a hymn book for female revivalists? And what would be excluded and why? This is a Eastern movement, and in fact, it, uh, it seems to be a separate strand of primitive Methodism. Uh, uh, I think it's Anne Carr and a few others had been, or um, not necessarily, yeah, I think they were ordained by the uh, primitive Methodists uh, uh, to preach, and uh, but they didn't abide by the the organization who should preach where. And so they would go and preach wherever, and the person, usually male, uh, who was appointed to preach in that sh church on Sunday would uh, arrive and find some, uh, some woman was already preaching in his place. And so they were uh, kind of expelled from the primitive Methodists and formed their own movement, the um, female revivalists. Uh, it didn't outlast the, um, the, the, the lifespan of their f uh, followers, and I think they may have joined the con New Connection afterwards, but uh, they, they published two separate hymn books. Um, those are not in the John Ryland's Library collection, but are in the British Library. But the British Library has very graciously put them on Google Books, and so you have access to them. Uh, but um, th there has been a study done. I don't have the reference in front of me of um, which which hymns were included, and the, the, um, the person studying it uh, said that uh, songs that were on the theme of submission were omitted. <laughs> and so it was kind of saying that um, th these were uh, songs of women taking charge uh, and, and not necessarily submitting. And so um, that was just the one comment that sticks in my mind. So yes, yeah, someone has worked on that. Uh, I have not. Um, I do have references and I'd be happy to provide them of the, of the two scholars that I've seen that have worked on it. In the ordination, I, I don't know for certain, but I suspect they probably would have used a terminology like consecrate or commission to distinguish it from full male ordination which they weren't doing yet for females at, at that early of a stage. That's helpful. I'm interested in what you say about um, Charles Wesley's hymns being more intercessory in nature um, and you know the, the comparison with the hymn <coughs> Uh, attributed to Jay Redfern, that, that one about girl, you know, girl. I mean, frequently Charles Wesley's hymns demand a response, um, albeit that that response is often a spiritual response to God. But I think, you know, frequently his hymns have the sort of the, the setting out of the theology and spirituality and then this, this response from the person singing. And I just wonder whether any of the hymns, in terms of, you know, the, the intercessory ones you talk about, also have this response even if it's not to actually go out there and, and do it, but is there some sort of sense of, you know, what is our part in, in doing this prayer for these people, you know, engaging in that prayer? You know, but how, how, does the, how does the believer respond in those hymns? Uh, that's not something uh, that's that's not that's in detail. Uh, I plan to do that, uh, but I was focusing on what was happening later. But the impression I get is that the response Charles Wesley uh, expected was prayer. And, and I do find that and that's a significant difference. Um, I don't think it's any less a response. Uh, I, I think uh, that uh, uh, people engaged in prayer, engaged uh, in prayer together, uh, is an appropriate response, and, and that's what would appear to be the theology of, of Charles and, and John Wesley too, to some extent. Um, I, I have read a bit more of John Wesley's perception of missions, especially his sermon on the subject, where he was expecting um, Christian communities around the world to be revived, nominal Christian communities who would then be engaged in missions. And, and again, interceding that God would do this, that Jesus Christ would come and claim his inheritance, is, in a sense, a response that is called for. Um, beyond that, I have not seen, um, uh, at least not uh, as overtly as in the later hymns, where, uh, where they were encouraged to go 
which is kind of interesting because both John and Charles did go in the early part of their career, and to have them kind of back off from that, even with the promptings of people like Thomas Koch, um, is, is interesting. And, and I, I'd, I'd like to see more uh, whether there was active discussions on this with Koch and whether they were discouraging him from being involved. Uh, but we have this proposal that was put forth by Koch uh, that presumably had been run by uh, John Wesley, and yet it was never acted on, at least not in, in the 18th century. Rather, he gets these new responsibilities and then se is sent off to America. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question, and again, would be, uh, would be uh, worthwhile pursuing. Uh, I'm wondering if you've looked into the hymn tunes that we used for any of these uh, and what insight that might give you into their meaning. Uh, so I suppose it could go in a couple of ways. It could give insight into the, where the stress falls in particular stanzas. But another thing would be that um, the fact that the, you can sing multiple hymns to a single tune actually seems to broaden the referential range of a particular song. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'm wondering what other songs were sung to these same tunes, and are there any tunes, or is there a particular commonality? Are they all major? Are they all? Yeah, are there any similarities in the tunes that are selected for missionary hymns? I'm, I'm not as familiar with the tunes. Could you mute me? Can you mute me? Uh, I'm not as familiar with the tunes themselves. Um, uh, in many of the hymn books, uh, only the words, only the lyrics are given. Uh, often, though, there is a notation indicating which tune uh, it should be sung to. And, and so that would be uh, a possibility. Um, th there are some, such as um, uh, from Greenland's ice, uh, Icy Mountains, which comes a bit later uh, and, and is included even in the Methodist hymn books. That tune is called the missionary tune, and I have seen that pop up in other places. Uh, speaking of tunes, though, I did find that I think it was Stamp, John Stamp, again, uh, the, um, uh, the primitive Methodist renegade that published a, a hymn book uh, a, a decade or so later from the ones that we were looking at. He does start off in his introduction saying, why should the devil have all the good tunes? And so that predates Larry Norman by uh, a century and a half at least. And he says that saying had been around for several decades even in his time. And so I tried to trace it further back and it seems to have appeared the first time in prints that I've found so far shortly after the death of uh, uh, George Whitfield. Uh, and, and he is the one who's accredited with initially saying it, not John Wesley. But uh, uh, Stamp said that this was the thinking of the Wesleys, of Whitfield, of Bourne, and, and others. And uh, so he, he, in his hymn book, it's very interesting to see that he has included uh, tunes uh, just by the name, you can see tunes such as Auld Lang Syne and God Save the King and uh, Poor Mary Ann, which, uh, whatever tune that is. Those who know tunes probably could find, or Victorian tunes could probably uh, trace those the tunes a bit better. So it is interesting to see the, this use of popular tunes uh, in, in the, the hymn book. Yeah, so that's really fascinating. It would be really interesting to see the number of tunes which have nationalistic overtones or a the colony or empire that are then used for missionary uh, songs. Yes. That's very good follow up to that one to make. You started out at the beginning by saying many of these were translated into other languages for use on mission field. And what strikes me thinking about the own history of the Church of the Nazarene and my experience with places in, in Africa is that the Church of the Nazarene went through a series of new hymnals over a number of years. But the ones that are embedded in the culture of Swaziland, where I'm talking about, is the 1950s, as it were, hymnal. So it's, it's three generations ago. And that continues to be sung and shapes theology. Now, there's, to me, there's sort of a cultural imperialism that went on here by translating it that way. And um, we be interested to see what post-colonial studies might make of the use of hymns. We've talked a lot about in terms of scripture and its use, but what about hymns? Right. Uh, as I mentioned, that there is now a growing movement looking at global hymnody, especially congregational hymnody, and, and I've just started reading some of the writings of, the, of this group, and, and it is fascinating to see some of the, the discoveries they're making, and, and they, they see it 
uh, not as much uh, just an indigenization or contextualization, but more of um, a dialogue with, with uh, the, the Indians, uh, for, for instance, uh, choosing which, which hymns they want. And this is what I found in late 19th century India as well with the Methodist Episcopal Church, where uh, for some reason, the Indian Christians really liked Ira Sankey's songs. And so within, um, I think within months or perhaps a year or so of his, his hymn books being published in Britain for, for the first time, they are in India. And uh, it's the Indian Christians who choose to translate those. And now, uh, speaking of tunes, those had a more, what some called more of a Sunday school uh, tune and uh, was, uh, were popular. They were somewhat, uh, they were discussed somewhat dismissively by um, some of the Methodists in Britain, but were re very popular in India and in China. And so it's interesting to see, again, in this dialogue that the Indians are choosing some of these tunes, translating the songs, but then at the same time also writing songs uh, in the, the Hindu style, the bhajans, or in the Muslim style, the ghazals, and, and missionaries writing, in, uh, writing bhajans and ghazals. And so uh, it's a very interesting dialogue, I find, between the missionaries and the, and the, and the indigenous Christians in some of these countries. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating field of study, and it's, it seems to be growing. Yes, it would be very interesting to see, sorry, it's just a conversation now, not a question, um, which, which tunes that have picked up and gained popularity amongst indigenous populations are built around the pentatonic scale, rather than the full, you know, western harmony and, you know, the, 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 it would be because pentatonic scale is almost universal in cultures, and so actually the songs that are written according to that scale might be the ones that sound more harmonic, more um, consonant to indigenous cultures rather than the ones that are built on more complicated Western harmony. That's helpful. There's also um, a, a question, I suppose, of how people um, access hymn books. Um, just, just from my experience, we were um, in ministry um, at Notting Hill at the beginning part of my ministry, and at that time when we had a new Methodist hymn book in the church um, in Notting Hill, the old hymn books, people sent to the West Indies because they, they wanted the hymn books. So they were using the old hymn book just by, you know, dint of having them accessible, being sent to them rather than, you know, having to purchase new books which wouldn't necessarily be what they wanted anyway. So, so sometimes, I suppose, you know, the, the hymn books people are using are the ones that they have access to in that way. And I don't know if that happened elsewhere. But, you know, Oh, that's very interesting. And, and so, and so, of where the uh, English uh, was was the, the medium of of worship, uh, such as the West Indies. Of course, that that was uh, they could use the hymn books, and and it was said, uh, or I think it's still in current use in the West Indies. Uh, let's sing a thank you. And so the idea of uh, thank you songs were very present, but but that was because they shared the common language in, in their worship. Um, uh, so there wasn't the translation needed, and translation could then also include culture. And and so it's yeah, it's, it is interesting. Some others, um, and I'm, I'm sorry to dwell on Sankey, but some others have looked at the settings of his music and said that the early expressions in his hymn book were much more syncopated, whereas when they finally move into the Methodist hymn books in Britain, they are much more staid and, and respectful, I suppose. And so it's interesting to see that transition even within um, English-speaking countries. Just one other interesting comment. This is really fascinating to me because the, the, the link between theology and music in many ways, and what's happening in other parts of the world. One of the things that it, I've experienced as well is the importation of new with worship group type music from anywhere in the world, without any, because the music is really good for a music uh, a worship group, but no particular thought given to what the lyrics are, yeah. and, and so the, the music is what is driving the production of the uh, song. So. One of the churches I worship in, when I'm in Swaziland, uh, is very high tech and very good. Uh, but I think what they sing is what they've learned from Hillsong or you know wherever it might be around the world, and it doesn't really matter to them. They just the music is brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, that will be.
of my own church here in Saskatchewan. We're in the midst of the Canadian prairies, and yet we sang these songs from Britain all about throwing out the light flying and then all these with uh, nautical motifs, which we had no experience of, and yet they were deeply meaningful to us as a congregation. So, yeah, that, that, that does happen. Um, th though you also uh, touch on this whole uh, period now where we are without uh, hymnals, without hymn books, and so it, it's a new dynamic, and um, I think the hymn books did provide some connection to the past that perhaps we have lost, a grounding, a continuity, as well as opportunity for change. And so it is a, it is a new period. Uh, though I, I just had come across recently that um, uh, when the Methodist Episcopal Church uh, celebrated the 100th anniversary of their missionary movement, this would have been 100 years ago, uh, in 1918, at their grand convention, they were using overhead projectors <laughs> in the sense that they had they were encouraged to put the words of the songs on slides and project them on the screen. And so even overhead projectors and um, um, PowerPoint uh, has a hundred year history in, uh, in Christian churches. And the question isn't there about theology and how we scrutinize what people sing when we're not using a book that's approved and people can put on the screen whatever they want. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Even people who are not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have, have, haven't quite hit 12 yet. Maybe you can tell us a bit about how far forward you're going to go chronologically. And if, if you have done more, have you seen any trends that develop? Um, another perhaps quick question is, did the missionary societies, any of them, produce their own hymnals or were they dependent on what the denominations were doing in that regard? That's one of the developments later in the 19th century, early 20th century, where you have um, uh, hymn books just of missionary hymns. Now, some of them were for missionary societies, such as the Church Missionary Society. They have several hymn books. Some of them were directed towards children, so you'll have a Sunday school missionary hymn book. Uh, but um, one of the books I've been looking at is uh, published by a free Methodist bishop, all missionary hymns. And so I'm, I'm doing some comparisons. Uh, even while I was in Manchester, I was directed to uh, some of the Nazarene hymn books, also on the theme of missions. And so I'd like to do a comparison between several of these uh, um, Wesleyan groups, uh, Methodist groups, uh, and, and their missionary hymn books. Uh, one, uh, one development that I've seen now and have just come across a few um, examples of what, uh, is of hymn books that were made up of uh, uh, hymns written by global Christians, not from North America or Europe. And um, not necessarily published by Methodists, but it, just generally looking at these collections of hymns from other parts of the world. And I, I find this fascinating and, and I hope to do a bit more study in that area as well. I'd like also to add now the, the American side of the picture, looking at some of the developments and the, the uh, inclusion of global hymns, global awareness in the uh, American Methodist hymnals of the various streams of the 19th century. And, and then eventually bring them together. I've even been looking at some of the um, Methodist hymnals published for Indigenous peoples here in Canada and want to, would like to kind of do a comparison of, of that hymnal with the one I looked in India, the one in the Cree language look, compared with the one in the Hindustani. And so, so those are the, some of the streams. Um, yeah, it's been an exciting new field, kind of just a, I'm a year into it and, and finding it endlessly fascinating and all kinds of rabbit trails to follow. Very good. Well, thanks very much for your presentation. We look forward to seeing how it goes.